novel and extremely reliable method for locating and counting the number of calling animals for measurements of their time differences of arrival between many pairs of receivers. The method was applied to calling marine mammals in the Chukchi Sea by Dan Woodridge, myself, Eloise Yang, Krishna Sivub Kumar, Alex Shoni, Pranav Iyer, Esther Lee, and Captain Burchard. The method was developed in the last 30 years and required four findings new to science, believe it or not. I will describe here the fourth discovery, and I'm happy to discover to discuss the other three should anybody be interested after the talk. So that animals are located in the ocean is to assume that they're on a horizontal plane and you use a two-dimensional model to locate them from the time differences of arrival. Basically, it's very difficult to determine depth, but it's not so hard to dis discover their latitude and longitude. And if you type in 2D TDOA for two-dimensional time difference of arrival, you will get 73,000 hits uh, on Google. So it's a very widely used technique. And the first known technique to me occurred in 1886 where the Japanese were interested in discovering where the tsunamis came from. So they measured the time differences of arrivals of tsunamis on the Japan coast and the islands. And they inferred, because they know the, the waterway speed, where the earthquakes occurred in the ocean. And it's true almost in all cases, but not always, but almost always, that the object that you're trying to locate is not in the same plane as your receivers. Okay, so let's suppose you actually do what's usually done in 2D time difference of arrival location, which is to plot a point where you think the sound came from. Well, of course, if you plot a point, the probability that that point actually coincides where the animal is is almost zero. It's almost a zero probability of being right. So what we want instead is a confidence interval that has 100% probability of containing the animal. And that's what we would want, and that's what I have developed. The Navy independently tested the software that I developed and verified that in all cases, the 100% confidence interval for location contained the true independently measured location of the, in their case, ship submarine. So uh, in the context of 2D location models, there's something that was unknown for 140 years about them that if you don't recognize causes a very large error in the 2D model. And I'm going to describe that's the fourth discovery. And the last thing I'm going to talk about here is how to obtain a reliable count for the lower and upper bound for the number of animals that produce the calls that you heard. So the time differences of arrival, let's suppose you have two receivers here and here, and if the sound comes in at the same time, at both receivers, then you know the animal's on a plane halfway between them. And if the sound comes in sooner here than here, then that plane deforms into a hyperbola. That's what happens in three dimensions, and if you want to know where the animal is, you add another receiver, you get another time difference, you get another hyperboloid, that intersects this hyperboloid, that gives you an ellipse, then you introduce a fourth receiver, that gives you a third hyperboloid, that'll intercept the ellipse at two points, and in three-dimensional space, if you want to know which two points it is, you introduce a fifth receiver, you get a fourth travel, you get a fourth travel time difference, a fourth hyperboloid, and it tells you which point is right. That's how it's done. There, okay, so what's wrong with 2D models? What I'm going to tell you now is extremely simple, but believe it or not, as far as I can tell, this has been unrecognized for the last 140 years. Suppose you have this whale sitting up here, maybe a kilometer above this receiver down here on the ocean floor. And the time it takes the whale sound to go from here to the receiver is T. So uh, in a two-dimensional model, you're actually computing the location down here in this plane where the receiver is. And what you want is the distance and the location of the whale in that two-dimensional model. So now, if you ask, 
what is the right speed you use in a two-dimensional model to get the right location of the whale, you get a surprising answer. What people do in those 69,000 hits is they choose in the ocean something like 1,450 meters per second, almost in all cases. So let's compute, let's shove this whale right over the top of this receiver, and let's suppose t is a second, and the right answer for the distance from the receiver is zero. It's gonna have to be right there in the two-dimensional model. So what speed do you need to use in a two-dimensional model to get the right answer? You have to use u equals h divided by t, and h is zero, and t is one, and you have to use a speed of zero meters per second to get the right answer on a two-dimensional model. That's a very simple finding, and I think it's been overlooked for 140 years. If you move the whale off the top of the receiver, you can see you get positive speeds because h is no longer zero. And so the speed you need to use in a two-dimensional model to get the right answer depends upon the distance of the whale from the receiver in the horizontal plane. That's if you want to get the right answer. Okay, so now we're going to go live in a two-dimensional model. It's called Flatland, and we suppose we're going to pretend we don't know anything about three-dimensional space, and we're going to investigate the repercussions of what happens if you really are going to stuck, stick with 1,450 meters per second. What, what are the errors that come up? What happens? So we don't know about 3D space, and we have radio engineers who are broadcasting radio signals on Flatland, and the radio engineers get a call from a home who complains that the radio station is now weak, and please fix it. So the radio engineers know very well that there could be something out in Flatland that could reflect a signal and interfere with the direct path 180 degrees out of phase, so they deploy their three radars on Flatland. They measure the distance to possible locations that reflect, and they intersect the three circles. They intersect at a point in Flatland, they drive out to the point, and they see Snoopy's doghouse, a little metal doghouse out in Flatland, and they just scooch the doghouse over a little bit to the left, and the interference goes away and everybody's happy. Okay, so what happens next? <coughs> what happens next is there is a UFO that hovers over Flatland. Okay, it's, people in Flatland don't know about three spatial dimensions and they don't know about UFOs, but the UFO knows how to reflect a signal. And the family calls back again and they say, we have weak home reception. So the radio engineers know how to solve this problem. They go put out their three radars, they go draw their three circles, and here's what they get. The circles almost inter uh, intersect at a point. This is 14,000 by 14,000 meters. You can see the three radar locations. And if you blow it up, the points don't intersect at the same point. The circles don't intersect at the same point. Something's wrong, and they know their instruments are better than this. But this is commonly known to occur if you use two-dimensional models. But they look around in that field, and they do not see Snoopy's doghouse being reappeared in anywhere in that field, nor anything else. OK, so they are frustrated because they believe their equipment and they like their science. So they're going to move their radars closer in to see if they can get a more accurate answer, because what could be more natural? But what happens when they do that is they get worse results. And here are the three circles intersecting again on the same scales, and everything's worse. So we have smart scientists on Flatland who know their instruments are working. What are they going to do? They are going to invent a sphere. They're going to say, well, there has to be a third spatial dimension of the universe, and if we intersect three spheres, we believe that there must be a reflecting object at plus or minus 400 meters above flat land is, is the origin. That's what they're gonna do. Well, the aliens aren't gonna let this just slide. They're delighted that the Flatland scientists have found this out, so they land and congratulate them on their discovery, and Flatland scientists have discovered three dimensional space. Okay, so I've now taken apart what happens along one leg in Flatland, okay? In two dimensions, in, in 2D, if you're gonna do time differences of arrival, now we see that you have to use a different speed along each leg to get the true answer. You can't use hyperbolas, you have to use something else. Now let's see what happens. Before we get there, I just wanna quantify what happens in the traditional 2D time difference of arrival model if you insist that the speed has to be 1,450 meters per second when actually the speed in sound is 1,450 1450 meters per second. What are the errors? So here are four receivers, and if you have a whale that's only 30 meters above it, this is 20,000 meters on a side here on these scales. Can I show those? Yeah, 20,000 meters. These are the errors in meters. This is 10 to the log 10 to the error. One means 10 meter error, two means 100 meter error, three means 1,000 meter error. 
And right near the receivers, which are right down here, you can get 2,000 meter errors because you insist that you have to use 1,450 meters per second. And it gets worse if you guess the wrong speed. Even if the ocean did only have 1,450 meters per second speed, you suppose you guessed it was four, you suppose you were off by five meters per second on your guess. Here's what the errors become. So even when you're far away from the receivers, you get large errors. So if you're going to get the correct answer out of a 2D model, you have to do something about it. And it's, I can tell you afterwards what you do about it to do it. You, it's fixable, but you can't do it as business as usual. So why are there black holes in 2D models? Because they're located at each receiver, and it's where the speed of sound has to be zero to get the right answer. The gravitational black holes, which are great to think about and read about in the newspapers, and um, the speed of light uh, at the event horizon of a black hole is zero meters per second, as seen from Earth. Otherwise, you could see it. It doesn't escape. So that's one of the reasons I call them 2D black holes. OK, now let's go on to uh, trying to figure out how to count the number of animals you heard. Of course, if you hear in animals, you could have always heard, if, no, if you hear in calls, you could have always heard in animals. Always, that's the upper bound for the number of calling animals that could have occurred. The question is, what's the lower bound? How, how few could that have been? What's the fewest number that could you use to explain what you heard? So in order to do that problem, uh, uh, you need a reliable confidence interval for location. So let's pretend the first call's reliable and for the, this is the 100% confidence interval for location for the first call, here's the second one right here. And we know that they occurred some time apart, let's say a minute. And so if the animal can swim from here to here in a minute, you know you could have heard either one animal or two animals. But if the intervals are too far to get to, then you know you heard two animals, right? And none of this will make sense unless you have an extremely reliable confidence interval for location, but that now exists. You can do that. <coughs> Let's apply this to Catherine Burchock's chaos experiment uh, in, in 2011 and 12. There are five receivers here, and the diameter of that little pentagon of receivers is six kilometers. Here is a bowhead whale call that was heard on all five receivers. On one receiver. And here's where it was. If you use the, whoops, I want to play it again. Here are the five receivers. You see the little red speck in the middle? That's the 100% confidence interval for location for that bowhead whale. It was in there. And I know it was not in there. I know it was in there. It really was in there. That's a reliable confidence interval. And that was on the 11th of October. OK, I'm going to play you 25 bowhead calls now and that occurred in a 35 minute period. Now, it's a sped up time sequence. And you'll see each of their confidence intervals. The five receivers are down here. What's the fewest number of animals that could explain that? Well, you have to put that into a program and figure out how many, how, what's the fewest number of whales that could explain those data in space and time? And the answer is three. It could have been as few as three animals. So all we, we know, what we know from this is that there were between three and 25 animals. But that's a reliable, that's a reliable number. It's something that's real. Uh, in this uh, derivation, I assume that the maximum swimming speed of a bowhead whale is 10 meters per second, which is about as fast as you can go. So this is a very conservative estimate for those bounds. My wish is to uh, apply this technology uh, with others. So I, I, I wish to collaborate with others on the use of this technology so I get to learn all the stuff that I wish I had time to take classes in marine biology and ecology that I never did, but I can learn now if I get to collaborate with others. I, I also wish to thank my sponsors which are not listed here, but it's the North Pacific Research Board, Microsoft, and the Office of Naval Research, and FOA. Thank you.
So, how could the Navy not know this? It's just like how everybody else didn't know it in the last 140 years. It's been used, it's custom. You know how science is, things become fads and then people stop thinking. <laughs> it just happens all the time, it's people. That's all this is.